So, about a month ago, I put out a tweet that said, if this is what Samsung's next flagship, the Galaxy S22 Ultra, looks like, I will shave off a sizable slit of my eyebrow. I was so horrified at the thought of this P-shaped squiggle on the back of a 2022 flagship that I was convinced there was no possible way that Samsung would go through with it. Well, I was right. And what we actually have is shaping up to be a very spicy fern indeed for five key reasons. Are my eyebrows still there? <laughs> so, number five is the software. In fact, what you're seeing right now is the software that the S22 Ultra will almost definitely come with, One UI 4. I've been testing a beta of it, and it's not just a few new features, but a visual redesign. And I think, or at least I hope, it also indicates a new direction for Samsung. More so than any past generation, this software just feels alive. Like when you apply a wallpaper, it will pull the key colors from that and use them to theme your entire phone, including the inside of some apps. It feels more vibrant and playful. The widgets feel more interactive than ever before, with more fleshed out animations and automatic adjustments to make them more consistent with each other. You can resize floating windows on the fly, and there's just a lot of subtle things, like how the home screen gently comes into focus when you leave an app, that make phones with this software feel more naturally responsive to your actions. Plus, based on early previews, it also looks like the adverts that have started creeping their way into Samsung software are gone. It's a little early to say for sure, but it would kind of make sense. It's very possible that the pressure that Samsung is facing from Xiaomi right now is forcing them to hold themselves to a higher standard. And if that is what's happening, it is good news for not just Samsung users, but for everyone, because other companies will then have to follow suit. And as a final icing on the cake, it also brings a new feature called RAM Plus, which can repurpose four gigabytes of internal memory as extra RAM. Meaning that if the S22 Ultra comes with a 16 gigabyte RAM option, you will have the equivalent of 20 gigabytes of RAM. You probably won't need it, but it's there in case you do. And if you are enjoying this video, then a sub to the channel would be one. Wonderful. I'm sorry. Okay, number four is design. And I'll admit, design is not one of the more important parts of a phone, but it's really exciting because just like with the software, I think this design indicates that Samsung as a company is rolling in the right direction. It doesn't take much digging to see that this brand has gone through some very questionable phases, as did we all. <laughs> <laughs> the phones that looked like plasters, cases that looked like bikinis, or just some straight up head scratchingly boring phones. But for the last year, almost everything that's come out of Samsung's doors has had strong design. The S21 Ultra looks like a stealthy ninja phone. The Z Flip 3 is minimal and flat, and all these limited edition phones And I would go as far as to say that I think this S22 Ultra looks even better. This is not a 100% confirmed and finalized design. We are still a couple of months away from launch, but this feels right. I think it's extremely close. And assuming that they can pull this look off, it's not just unique. The only phone that looks close would be the LG Velvet, which was one of LG's best designed phones in my opinion, but it would also eliminate the two unfortunate side effects of having a big fat camera module, wobbling when you're on a table and constant finger collisions. There's apparently gonna be a black and a green, which look kind of whatever, but I would do bad things for these white and red ones. These are a statement. But there's also a less obvious design change here. It's increasingly looking like the S22 Ultra will not just be the next S series phone, but also the next Note series phone. You might know that Samsung skipped launching a Galaxy Note in 2021. And so my best guess as to what they're planning to do is to just pool their resources to make one phone that will appeal to both categories of users. It feels like a strange move. Like given that the majority of Samsung flagship purchases buy an S series instead of a Note series phone, it's fair to assume that most aren't users of that S Pen. But it doesn't look like it's coming at the cost of anything. The battery is apparently still going to be a huge 5,000 milliamp hours. The charging power will actually be upgraded from 25 watts to 45 watts. The camera system has been brought inside the body instead of pushing it further out to be able to fit the pen. My best guess is that they will make the main body a little thicker just to accommodate everything. But for an ultra phone with this much stuff, I'm okay with that. 
Because if you are going to have this S Pen as a feature, then I think it's really important that you can actually fit it inside. Like with the Z Fold 3 last year, you might remember that I kind of raged at the fact that Samsung pitched that phone as a Galaxy Note replacement, regularly reminding us of how it had S Pen functionality. But the simple fact that the pen wasn't built in meant that only like 10% of people were actually gonna go out and buy it, that they'd need a separate case to store it, and that they'd have to remember to charge it individually to use it. But to have the thing built inside of the S22 Ultra would be a strong positive. Number three is the cameras. If you've been following Samsung closely, you'll have seen that two months ago, they unveiled something absolutely crazy. Something seemingly so far ahead that it would have been instantly enough to replenish anyone's dwindling faith in the company. A 200 megapixel image sensor made to feature in their upcoming phones. But before we get carried away by hype, I don't think their next flagship phone will actually use this sensor. According to the Leica Ice Universe, he is saying with 100% certainty that this S22 Ultra will instead use a 108 megapixel main camera, a 12 megapixel ultra wide camera, and then two zoom cameras, a three time zoom and a 10 time zoom camera, both at 10 megapixel. Or in other words, basically the same camera system as the S21 Ultra this year. I mean, technically the zoom cameras will have new image sensors, but this is not gonna be some sort of zoom into a different planet type of experience. And I've gotta be clear here, I am not happy about the fact that this spec sheet looks basically the same as this one's. The fact that they've announced this 200 megapixel sensor months ago, and yet they won't have it in next year's flagship is nothing short of a buzzkill. And while we're at it, it is also making me a little concerned. This idea of not using their most advanced technology so that they can have a nice pretty design, it is an indicator that Samsung might be considering form over function. And like, the fact that they had a fully fledged Samsung launch event last month, where the main product announcement was that you can now like, customize the color of your Z Flip 3, it does make me feel a little uneasy as someone whose priority is the technology itself. But equally, using the same cameras as last year might actually make a lot of sense here. From a business perspective, because you've got to remember that their flagship from two years ago, the Galaxy S20 Ultra, that was packed to the seams with new tech, 108 megapixel camera, 100 times zoom, enormous battery. It didn't meet sales expectations. The Galaxy Z Flip 3 though, which is fashion focused, but quite lacking on the specs front, sold more than expected. But it might not just be good for Samsung, it might also be better for the consumer. The main reason that I'm not mad, and instead curiously optimistic about these cameras is, it's something that's been on my mind recently. Yes, I am a nerd. You might have noticed that over the last few years, we have had so many phones coming out claiming huge improvements in camera hardware. Sensors that are 50% larger, lenses that will let in 200% more light. But in almost every single one of these situations, the end results are rather anticlimactic. It's incredibly confusing for consumers because of course, letting in 200% more light is going to mean significantly better photos, right? So why is that not happening? Well, I think it's a clear indicator that smartphones are increasingly relying on processing rather than optics to take their photos. I watched a really interesting video recently where someone took the same photos on the original iPhone from 2007 and the iPhone 12 Pro. And obviously there was a ridiculously huge gap between their outputs, not even in the same tier, not even in the same universe. However, he then used a series of really powerful pieces of software to enhance the original iPhone's photos to the point where actually they weren't nearly as far off as you'd expect them to be. And this is just it. The minute they were able to replicate the effects of beefy camera hardware with machine learning and software, well, why wouldn't you? It will mean that every phone you make will be cheaper. It gives you many more options, like being able to refocus shots after you've taken them, and it means you have more power to improve the camera performance later via software updates. However, I guess you could say this is the downside. Because of this, it's becoming really hard to know how good a phone camera is going to be until you've used it. It's no longer about the specs of the camera. It's not even about how powerful the chip is. It's the unmeasurable software optimization that spells out how they work together. That's becoming the key. 
And so, we end up with situations like this. The iPhone 12, for example, has a really good camera, even with a tiny sensor and just 12 megapixels of resolution. And yet, this Honor 50 has an extremely poor camera, even with a sizable sensor and a 108 megapixel resolution. Having better camera hardware will increase the ceiling of what you're able to technically achieve, but because no company is squeezing the most out of the hardware they already have, we've regularly seen bigger improvements to image quality in a year where the hardware hasn't changed. And the company has just spent that time optimizing what they do have. And so, what I'm trying to say about this S22 Ultra is that while the camera hardware looks pretty inconsequential, and on the face of it, disappointing, I'm excited to see if it means that we'll actually have a highly polished and optimized experience because of it. And if we do get that, then I think there's a very good chance that the S22 Ultra will be the best phone camera we'll have seen up until that point. The S21 Ultra is already close, and this is exactly what it needs. Number two then, is the screen. And to be honest, there's not a huge amount of detail about it yet, but a few key things going for it. One, it doesn't look like Samsung will opt for an under-display camera. One day, this tech will be great. But that day is not today. And I, I was a little concerned when I saw that they used one of these on their $1,500 Z Fold 3, and that there was a very severe hit to the image quality from it. But thankfully, it looks like they're prioritizing pure performance here. Secondly, we've seen a leak of the apparent screen protector that's going to go on this phone. And it's a solid indicator that, in fact, the screen's borders are going to be even slimmer than last generation. We are talking fractions of a millimeter here, so not a major shift. But given that a lot of phones do look the same from the front as they did like two years ago, it's good to see some improvement. And three is just the simple fact that Samsung makes really good screens. Rich colors, super high peak brightness, no weird looking corners jutting out. The S21 Ultra was labeled by many as the best OLED screen to date. And there's a good chance the S22 Ultra will follow in its footsteps. There's already leaks to suggest that it will be a record holder. But number one is something a little more tangible. It's no secret that for a while now, Samsung's been having a bit of a crisis with its own in-house Exynos chipsets. For the last five years, these chips have been anywhere from slightly behind their Snapdragon equivalents to so far behind that they felt a generation apart. However, the crown jewel, the supposed savior of Exynos, will finally be coming to fruition in this next phone. And there's a lot of talk that this will turn Samsung's single biggest weakness into its single biggest strength. I'm, of course, talking about their collaboration with AMD. Samsung has confirmed that their next Exynos chip is going to have its graphics cores designed by AMD, using the same architecture that they used to build the PlayStation 5. And this is likely to mean three things. One, performance jump. I'm expecting anywhere from a 30 to a 50% leap in graphics. Two, better thermal management, which is important because past Exynos chips have managed to lose as much as 50% of their performance with continued use, as they've gotten hot and so had to dial down how fast they were running to control that heat. And finally, new technologies, with I think the headline one probably being ray tracing. For those of you who didn't follow the PS5 launch, ray tracing is essentially a hyper-realistic way of rendering light in games. It's seen very much as a generational leap over what came before it. And if you've played a game that uses this tech, you'll have realized how game-changing it is. I love this idea of the smartphone being a proper gaming console. And it makes total sense, given that for most people, it is the gadget that we make sure we have everywhere. It is the most portable, most connected device we own. However, the one thing that does somewhat hamper this excitement is on the app developer side of things. Developers do not treat mobile the same way that they treat consoles. When you design a game for, say, the PlayStation 5, you have the reassurance that every single person is using exactly the same hardware. And so you can utilize that hardware and all of its technologies to make the most beautiful, immersive game possible. But when you design a game for mobile, you have to account for the fact that, yes, while some people are using, say, a next-gen Galaxy S22 Ultra, equally, some are using a $50 Alcatel. Or maybe even a $2 passion fruit. And this means that if you want your game to be successful, you have to build it around the lowest common denominator. And so going off past history with stuff like this, ray tracing in mobile games won't become a thing until the majority can support it. So I don't see this as turning the gaming market upside down, more as the beginning of a new era. But that's still exciting to see.
I have literally spent the last 45 minutes trying to cover my eyebrows in face putty. Yeah, this ain't gonna work. <laughs> to find out if the new Google Pixel 6 Pro is worth the hype, click here. Or to understand the increasingly strange situation with Huawei, that video is here. My name is Aaron, this is Mr. Who's the Boss, I'll catch you in the next one.